And good evening. Uh, this is one of eight uh, community meetings that we are doing uh, uh, by Zoom uh, because of uh, uh, the COVID issues. Uh, this is for District 4 on the east side of Detroit. Uh, and if you haven't been to one of these before, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit. Then uh, we have one of our uh, cabinet officers today, Charity Dean, uh, the head of the Department of Civil Rights, Inclusion, and Opportunities. Uh, and then we will take questions on anything that we talk about or anything that's on your mind. Uh, and we, we hope most of the questions will focus on District 4, but we will uh, answer uh, whatever you'd like to talk about. Um, but I want to start at the same place we always start, uh, which is COVID-19. Uh, and this isn't going to go away. We're going to be having this conversation for another six months. Detroit continues to do very well. But if you saw today, uh, you now have Dr. Burks and Dr. Fauci, the two national leaders, uh, fighting with the president uh, because Dr. Birch and uh, Dr. Fauci are talking about the fact uh, that uh, this uh, pandemic is rising in the United States right now. You can see from our chart, it is not... Uh, certainly on the death side, uh, the compliance by the residents of the city have dropped it dramatically. But I want you to see we are going to be more and more at risk every week that goes by, and it's not because of what we're doing. Uh, at this point, Detroit's probably got the lowest infection rate in the state of Michigan, if not in the, in the Midwest. Um, but this is the map of hot spots as it existed in the middle of June. Uh, and the way this map works is hot is red is hottest, then orange. Uh, blue is the coolest. It means it's going down. And you can see in the middle of June, it looked like uh, COVID was by and large uh, contained in this country and certainly uh, in Michigan. Uh, and then by the end of June, uh, we saw uh, it start to spread. And it was the states in the South uh, who denied the science, said we don't need to distance, we don't need to mask. Uh, and uh, everybody should be free, uh, and science deniers, uh, many of them have paid the price in a very public way. Uh, by the middle of, of uh, July, you're seeing the red and the orange, and it is spreading up through Kentucky, through Tennessee. It is heading back to the Midwest. So despite everything we've done, there are a whole lot more folks uh, closer, and now uh, uh, you're seeing dark orange, uh, and this weekend, uh, something that I did not think I would see. Ohio passed the state of Michigan in total number of cases. You go back to April, uh, and the governor of Ohio got a lot of national credit, which he deserved for having moved early to shut the state down. Uh, now Michigan is not even in the top 15 uh, because of the job Governor Whitmer has done, and, and in large part uh, the, the job that Detroiters have done. Uh, but we are going to be more at risk because it's heading this direction. Let me show you what's happening in Detroit. It's the first thing I look at every day to give you a sense uh, because I'm totally driven by what the numbers show. And so back in April, we had 800 people with COVID in the hospital, 259 events in danger of dying. And we basically every day had about 125 cases. We were almost a third of every case in the state. By July 1st, uh, what the uh, residents of the city had done had been dramatic. Uh, we cut down the number of people in the hospital. We were down to 12 people on vents and only 21 new cases a day. Today's numbers were still about the same level in the hospital, still about the same level on the vents, but we're seeing the number of new cases coming in at the rate of 30 a day. We're only 5% of the state. Now, the vast majority uh, are in uh, the middle and out state areas. We have quite a bit of, of spread in the suburbs, but you can see that we're starting to trend up. We can keep our businesses open. We can keep our hair and nail salons open. We can keep our restaurants open. We can keep our auto plants open. We can keep our offices open if you'll wear your masks uh, and honor the distancing and the hand washing. There is no reason uh, that we can't continue to open. I'm glad to see the casinos uh, will be opening on Wednesday at 15% capacity, uh, just as the restaurants have opened successfully. The casinos will open successfully. Uh, but it's going to mean all of us committing primarily uh, to the masks. So we've now done more than 60,000 tests. Uh, and Detroit is really the national leader. Have you seen the stories in the South where people are in line for seven hours? Uh, but 
And we've had the benefit of having Quicken doing our appointments. You can call for an appointment. You can get in tomorrow, uh, and uh, you'll get through uh, without any difficulty. Tests are free. They don't need a prescription. Uh, and if you, even if you don't, half the people who test positive don't have symptoms. Uh, so if you haven't had a test in a while, get a test. Be sure, and uh, your family and, and those around you uh, can be protected if it turns out uh, you do happen to be positive. We talk about uh, what's going on specifically in District 4, because District 4 is now the home for the largest manufacturing investment made in America in years, uh, the FCA plant, uh, where 5,000 people are going to go to work at that Jeep plant. It's going to be built by the end of December. It's going to be making Jeeps in March. People are going to be going to work. And so FCA has started doing the interviews. Uh, and as you probably remember, we made an agreement with FCA that they would interview every single qualified Detroit candidate before they got to anybody outside the city because we put up the money uh, to buy the land. Uh, and hiring is open right now. Uh, and Detroit at Work has been so successful at getting FCA thousands of qualified applicants that even though we're in the period where FCA was allowed to hire from other places, they just extended to August 30th a Detroit-only application process. That's how well Detroit at Work is doing. They're getting great candidates out of the city. So if you were laid off from the other job that you were on, there is still time to go to Detroit at work, get your application in, and you get in under the Detroit preference uh, because you live in this city. So they've already interviewed 800 of our residents. They're scheduling 2,000 more. Uh, they're going to start a couple of thousand jobs uh, by the end of this year. They'll be up to 5,000 by the end of next year. Uh, and one of the things that is really exciting about this is they've been very positive about returning citizens being very welcome uh, to apply. Uh, so this is a good paying job uh, that you have a real chance to get because you're in the city of Detroit. If you want this, act now, contact Detroit at work. I'll show you the contact at the end of this. But here's the interesting thing. The assembly plant means you assemble. Somebody's got to make all the parts that go into the Jeep. And so Dakota is going to make the dashboards. And they're building it right now at the old Kettering High School site that had been long abandoned. They're hiring 300 people right now. And Dakota agreed to the same deal. They are interviewing all Detroit candidates before they interview anybody from the suburbs through Detroit at Work. Uh, they're going to start hiring in October. Uh, and they're going to have to be making dashboards by March because that's when FCA is going to be assembling uh, the vehicles. So you have more opportunities. Then we have Flexingate which is located over on the east side of Detroit, not far away in District 3. They're making uh, the bumpers and much of the exteriors uh, for the Fords being made at the Wayne Assembly Plant. Uh, and they are hiring right now and expanding. And then uh, over uh, on the west side, uh, we have 300 people being hired by DMS. Uh, and they make uh, a number of parts for the F-150. All of these jobs and many, many others, whether it's hotels, whether it's construction, uh, whether it's uh, being a driver, whatever you want to do, you can go to DetroitAtWork.com uh, and we will get you tracked uh, to a job that you want. And so uh, a lot of the folks who have been laid off, the $600 a week has stopped. I hope they reach a deal in Washington to resolve it, uh, but uh, you should not wait. If you think your job is not coming back, uh, we have a whole bunch of vacant jobs where Detroiters are getting preference uh, right now. The other thing that FCA, and there were a number of provisions in their community benefits agreement, but they agreed uh, to help improve the neighborhood around the new plant. They agreed to take out 300 houses in three years for an immediate blight removal. Uh, in the first year, which ended in May, uh, they got 116 done. This next year, we've got 129 already under contract, 34 on Beneteau. Beneteau is a street that runs immediately west of the plant and is probably the street most affected uh, by this plant. And so we made them a priority. And so those 34 houses will all come down uh, this year. And then next year, the last 55, which will bring us to 300, uh, will be completed. And so one piece after another, uh, all of it was delayed by COVID, uh, but we have it moving again going down the road. 
on East Warren in the area that I would say is roughly from Corville to Cadu. That may move a little bit, um, but this is one of the areas where we believe that we can rebuild uh, this area into a vibrant commercial district. My family's from this neighborhood, and Warren was very much a vibrant one. Uh, when I would visit my uh, grandparents over here uh, when I was a kid. Uh, and so the way this works is we have a series of community meetings. And I'll just show you in the next district in Conant, it looks like this. They're about a year ahead of you in the schedule. And they're going to start work on a new streetscape that looks like that. That's what the neighbors along Conant decided. The neighbors along East Warren are going to get to decide uh, what your uh, a particular streetscape is going to look like. So they're about halfway through the processes. We're going to make decisions by the end of the year. We're going to start construction next year. So when you get a notice to come to the community meeting on the East Warren streetscape, if you want to decide, do I want to have four lanes? Do I want to have three lanes? Do I want to make it shorter so that I can get across the street without uh, somebody speeding down and hitting me? Whatever the case may be, uh, what we found is on Livernois, on West McNichols, on Kirchhoff, we are building absolutely beautiful streetscapes with neighbors' participation. Uh, and I believe deeply in the collective wisdom of the neighborhood. So these decisions are not being made by the planners of the city of Detroit. They're ultimately being made. And I'm going to come out, and I, as I always do, we'll have a conversation, and people will vote, and you will pick the streetscape option that you want because you're the one that's going to have to live with it uh, for several years. It's an exciting time, great chance to bring East Warren back, and I hope you'll come out and participate. Uh, Jefferson Chalmers, we put an enormous uh, amount of time in. Uh, Letty, what was the street? What was it? Okay, so this is the way it looked last year. We got hit with record high Great Lakes levels in the Detroit a river flowed over backyards where people uh, had not put up uh, the appropriate seawalls, uh, and it caught us by surprise. This year, we acted early. Uh, last year, 400,000 sand bays got filled by volunteers and workers in order to protect that neighborhood. But we can't go year to year with people uh, pouring out and, and pouring sand into bags. And so uh, everybody in the neighborhood knows we put in a tiger dam. We weren't sure how it was going to work. Started in early April, it completed in June, and it, we have had a great deal of success. There were a couple of uh, backyards that were so far gone, some water leaked through, but nothing compared to last year. And if you looked at what happened around the state, um, the Tiger Dam worked. We're probably going to have to use the Tiger Dam for one more season. Uh, we'd like the Army Corps of Engineers to help us design some permanent solutions, but they also got backed up uh, with COVID. Uh, but I think we feel good about the direction we're going as far as being able to protect the neighborhood until we can get some permanent solutions uh, to what is likely to be a continuing issue uh, with the water levels. Um, City Council took an action that I think is of potentially enormous benefit to District 4, Proposal N, and uh, Councilman Andre Spivey was the lead sponsor. He fought for this tooth and nail because he felt like District 4 has not gotten uh, the amount of support it should get in blight removal. And of course, people have felt this way for many, many years back to 1965 when the city leaders promised they would get rid of what they then called the vacant house menace. Uh, 1965 was a minor problem compared to what we've had recently. Um, so with the help of the Obama administration, we got 21,000 abandoned houses down in six years. Nobody in America has ever done anything like it. Uh, but we still have 14,000 to go. Every one of those red dots is a house that cannot be saved. It's a potential risk to your children. It's a potential risk to catch fire, to spread to the house next door. It's bringing down the property values. Uh, and if we are going to have the kind of city we want, we can't have them here. And uh, these dots are just the ones in District 4. We have 2,700 houses in District 4, the second most of any of the city council districts that still need to be come down. That will not be a surprise uh, to the people who live in these communities. But here's the positive side, and this is what Councilman Spivey lobbied to have put in and is in this plan. That is, we're going to save the houses we can save. And in fact, there's 8 
thousand abandoned houses in the city that are structurally sound. Many of them brick houses. Uh, it wasn't the house was bad, as people left so fast uh, that they left uh, good houses behind. We've boarded them up, which has helped some, but it hasn't been nearly enough. And in District 4, there are more than 1,600 vacant houses that we could save. In this district alone, we could have within three or four years 1,600 more families. What would that mean to the housing situation in the city, the ability to find a place uh, to rent, the ability to buy a place instead of paying rent? So uh, with the participation of city council and Councilman Spivey, uh, proposal N, which you, this is your decision, uh, you're going to get a chance to decide on, on November 3rd. Here's the first thing we're going to do. First priority, we're going to save each one of the 8,000 houses that can be rehabbed by securing the exterior. And I'll show you how we're going to do that. But we're going to start with saving the houses we can save and moving families in. Then we'll go demolish about 8,000 houses that can't be saved. We'll get the worst of the blight. The land bank has certainly was never uh, well equipped to run demolitions. The federal rules required us uh, to run uh, the demolitions through a separate agency, which, which it just wasn't ready. But that's over. All of the federal money has been spent. This will be run by the city procurement department with city council oversight. We have not had any problems uh, on this side. So we're excited about the new structure. The other thing is when you're not using federal money, you're using Detroit dollars, we can give preference to Detroit companies. When it's federal money, uh, you can't do that. But we're entitled to use Detroit funds to give preference to our own employers, and we can make these companies hire 51% of Detroiters doing the work. So we'll have Detroiters working for Detroit companies uh, rebuilding Detroit neighborhoods. And this can be done with no increase in the taxes that you're paying now. Because we have paid off so much debt since bankruptcy, we are able to borrow this money without having your taxes go up. 8,000 houses renovated, 8,000 houses demolished, city companies, city employees, and no increase in taxes. That's what Councilman Spivey pushed through. And so you've seen this. In District 4, we've had a lot of houses that have been renovated because we're sure some quality housing. But here's one on Lake Point. Uh, and here's uh, the way we've renovated. The land bank has sold lots and lots of these vacant houses. Uh, this one on Newport now looks like this. We know we can do this. We've really targeted Morningside, and this house on Three Mile Drive has been restored beautifully. This is what the land bank is doing. When they're not demolishing, they do a great job. Uh, they can get these houses in the hands of homeowners, and 70% of these houses that are being bought are bought by renters in Detroit. So Detroiters are tired of paying $800 or $1,000 a month in rent, and they realize, I can buy the house, fix it up, and still only pay $700 and come out ahead and have something to pass on to my kids. This house on Corville, hard to believe anybody walked away from that, now looks like this. We can do this 8,000 more times, 1,600 more times in District 4 alone. But what happens if we don't do it? And you've all seen this. 1,000 houses a year that could be saved today, a year from now will be too far gone, whether it's vandals, whether it's arson, whether it's the weather. So this house on Clover Lawn, this is how it looked in August of 18, and here's how it looked one year later. This house on Hamburg could have been saved last August. Now it's gone. We're going to step in 8,000 times and make sure this doesn't happen. So how do we do that? The first thing is we're going to go in and clean them out. Uh, and so we'll take the trash and all the other stuff that's in somebody's houses, and in the backyards, we will clean them out. Then we'll seal them up. Today, we've used plywood. Plywood's better than nothing, but plywood's not a very good solution. You've all seen people pull off plywoods. Uh, you get uh, squatters get in, drug dealers get in, uh, people are in there lighting fires. And so we are going to use something like SecureView, which is essentially bulletproof plastic that is secured to the house so people cannot get in and out. You can preserve it. And, or we'll use the heavy steel processes and we'll go on the roof and we'll fix the holes in the roof so the rain's not pouring in and fill in the basements. 
we're going to go through and secure these houses in a way that now people will want to come in and take them. And once you do that, we can go to community partners, we can go to neighbors, we can go to home buyers and say, look, uh, the house is secure. You can put a furnace in, nobody's getting in or out of there, it's been sealed up. There's no rain coming in to damage the work that you're, being, you're doing. Uh, and we are working now with city council on something we'll announce in September, but we want to give neighbors and their families a preference to buying houses in your neighborhood. Nobody cares more about the, who's in the house in your neighborhood than the neighbors who already live there. We think we can build on our strong neighbors. So how do you do this without raising taxes? And this is probably uh, one of the most exciting things. We have had our bond rating upgraded seven times since 2014. Now, when we came out of bankruptcy, everybody's thinking, oh, Detroit, they'll be back in bankruptcy in no time. It's been just the opposite. The national uh, attention on our financial management and every one of the members of Detroit City Council has been committed to making sure that we never have Kevin Orr come back in here again. And so everything has been balanced. We put money away in reserves. Uh, even in the last round of budget cuts when COVID hit, Standard & Poor's put out a national memo citing Detroit as acting responsibly to make sure we don't run in to deficits. Uh, and so we are confident uh, that because we've already paid down more than $180 million, uh, we can sell these new bonds. It'll be like refinancing your house when you fix your kitchen. We'll spread out the payments over more years, but what you're paying each year will not go up. So your taxes will not go above the level that you have today. Here's something that I have never experienced in the city of Detroit. Um, the reason this got on the ballot uh, was in large part the lobbying that was done by the black contractors who operate in the city. Because now that we're doing this from the city, we can legally give preference to Detroit companies. They still got to do the job. They still got to give us a competitive bid, but you get bonus points if your headquarters is here. You got bonus points if your office is here. You get bonus points if 51% of your workers are Detroiters. And in a close bid, that shifts uh, the, the money to the Detroit companies. Uh, and because of that, the Detroit companies said, this is what we've been waiting for for years. The chance for companies, primarily black companies in Detroit, to be able to win Detroit contracts and put Detroiters to work. And so what happened was a coalition of 20 black Detroit contractors, they were the ones who said loud and clear to council, this is our turn, this is our chance where we can build wealth in this city and hire uh, Detroiters in the city, we will remove the blight. And that group uh, committed to the 51%, you can see there Councilman Spivey, uh, who led that. And a big part of why they were so confident uh, is because the person I'm going to bring up next. But what we have now is a plan for Detroit at work to, to train the people who will go to work doing the rehabs of the houses, to go to work at the demolition. Every demolition is 15 jobs. We're going to train people. Most of those jobs can be done for Detroiters. So you're going to get a chance to decide. Do you want the houses in our neighborhoods to go from that to that, or do you want them to go from here to here? And Will it be done by Detroiters? And so the person who's been driving this is our Director of Civil Rights, Inclusion, and Opportunity, Charity Dean. And when I ran for mayor in 2013, 250,000 people had left the city in the previous 10 years. And as I sat in living room after living room, what everybody said to me is, if you get elected, you need to remember who stayed. And it's something that I never forget for a second. I did not get elected by the people who left. I got elected by the people who stayed. And when you talk about inclusion, every political candidate in the world talks about inequality and inclusion. It doesn't take any great skill to complain about the problem. Uh, look at the, what's happening here. Everybody complains about the problem. But who makes sure when that new housing is built that people of low income actually get a share of it? Who makes sure? When the construction contracts are let, Detroiters are getting those job opportunities. Who makes sure when there is employment at the factories, Detroiters are getting those chances? We have a department and a leader who does that. Uh, and she isn't measured on the quality of her rhetoric. 
uh, she produces results. And she has been so forceful in her advocacy uh, for Detroiters uh, that that group of black Detroit contractors went to city council and demanded this be placed in the ballot because they knew Detroiters would get the opportunity under proposal N. I want you to get a chance uh, to hear from her uh, yourself, our, our civil rights director, Charity Dean. Thank you, Mayor. What a summer. Protests spark across the country. The largest civil rights demonstration to date. Tensions high and the hope for change in the air. A large group of civil rights leaders and hopeful Detroiters march through the streets of Woodward. They take a turn onto Jefferson. And at the end of the march, the speakers begin to speak. The last speaker is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He lays out a vision to Detroit and to the nation about racial justice. He gives what is now his infamous I have a dream speech right here in the city of Detroit. Dr. King's message to the nation and to Detroit was that now is the time. Not tomorrow or next week when it's easier to do so, but now is the time to lift up our city, our nation, from what he called the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of justice. And just like then, now is the time for us in Detroit to do the same. This message is not new, and we have been committed in this administration to this work for some time. However, sometimes messages on equality and equity and justice they can mean different things to different people. So allow me to paint a visual to help frame what I'm talking about today. Equality. As you can see in this picture, there are three people watching a game from behind a fence. There's a tall, medium, and short person. Equality says they all get the same box to watch the game. And while this does help the tall person and the middle person, the short person is unable to see. Equity. In this picture, which attempts to describe equity, everyone gets a box based on their height. So the short person gets two boxes, the middle person gets one box, and the tallest person doesn't get a box at all. Equity here is achieved because everyone can now see the game. They all have access. Justice. In this last picture, no person needs or has a box because the root cause is gone. The fence or the barrier has been removed and three people receive justice and can view the game. The work of equity with the ultimate goal of justice is what I have the distinct pleasure of working on in two ways at the city of Detroit. First, as the director of civil rights inclusion and opportunity and also as the chair of the city of Detroit's equity council. So first, allow me to talk to you about the work that we're doing in the civil rights inclusion and opportunity. But first, what is this department? Well, 20 years almost to the date before Dr. King made that speech here in the city of Detroit, there was a large uprising. The then Mayor Jeffries formed an interracial committee to really understand the root cause of this racial uprising in the city of Detroit. This committee took the form of many iterations it included many city department heads and eventually became the Human Rights Department, which we now know as the Civil Rights Inclusion and Opportunity Department. The city charter gives us clear guidance on what we are to do. We are charged with endeavoring for mutual understanding of residents, securing the rights of citizens with, to service from city government without discrimination, and we are to work to eliminate discrimination and the results of past discrimination. And this work in order to do this important work, we have an amazing team that works every single day on these hard issues. So what do we do in our office as a civil rights team? How do we eliminate those barriers? How do we work toward equity and ultimately justice? Well, discrimination is an obvious barrier, and our team works hard to investigate complaints of discrimination in the city of Detroit. 
Our human rights statute in Detroit is pretty broad, and it is illegal to discriminate based on race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, even public benefit status in the city of Detroit. And if you've been discriminated against or witnessed someone being discriminated against, we can help you. Language also poses a barrier for residents. So in our office, we make sure that residents can access city services in their first language. In our effort toward equity and justice, we have to provide space for there to be that mutual understanding that the city charter talks about. In Dr. King's speech, he talked about not just the need for black people to be free, but for all people to be free. See, that's the beautiful thing about the pursuit of justice. When the barrier is removed, it makes it better for everyone. So one of the ways that we endeavor in this mutual understanding is by celebrating our differences. Examples include our official celebration of Juneteenth, highlighting Arab American business owners during Arab American History Month, and even our Hispanic Heritage Celebration. Last year, a resident had an issue of discrimination at a local establishment. After meeting with the involved parties, our office launched our Let's Talk About Race series, where we convened Detroiters from all backgrounds to engage in honest dialogue about racial issues as we continue to move toward equity. This series took a halt during COVID-19, but we will be relaunching this series virtually during the fall. Part of making sure that voices are being heard is listening ourselves. Members of the disability community have been advocating tirelessly for an Office of Disability Affairs. This office will be uniquely positioned to work with all city departments to ensure that Detroiters with disabilities are represented in every area of city government. After meeting meetings with the mayor, after city council approved the budget, we are excited to announce that we are launching this office this fall. We recognize that the road to equity and ultimately justice requires listening. And as such, we have conducted two community input meetings and have launched a community input survey on our website to hear about ideas and ways that this office can best serve the disability community. Last week, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We still have a ways to go, but we are committed to ensuring access to all Detroiters. So what else do we do? We make sure Detroiters are hired on major projects. It is no secret that employment can be a barrier for Detroiters, especially in the skilled trades. So we work hard to make sure that projects that are required to hire Detroiters actually hire Detroiters. And when they don't meet their 51% contribution, when they don't meet their 51% target, they pay a workforce contribution. To date, we have collected close to $9 million in contributions. That money goes to Detroit at work to, to train Detroiters for construction jobs. We also recognize that unions have a huge role to play. And with that in mind, our STEP program helps us with that barrier. Although many of the projects are short-term projects, we have partnered with the carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and labor unions to make long-term commitments, joining us on the journey toward equity and justice by committing to increase the number of Detroit apprentices they hire for 10 years. We make sure promises are kept. We know that it is a privilege to do business in the city of Detroit. And with that privilege comes a unique opportunity to engage with residents. Doing development, doing development in Detroit is unlike any other major city. We have made it clear that equitable and just development is our aim. And to that end, we are the only major city in America that has codified that in a community benefits ordinance. Our ordinance has yielded millions of dollars in benefits for residents, and it is our job in the Civil Rights Department to make sure these commitments are kept. We release twice a year our community benefits report. Coming this August will be the next version of that, and then later this year we will release our tax abatement report. We make sure Detroit businesses can thrive. Barriers today don't often look like the barriers Dr. King spoke about. Nevertheless, we are relentless in ensuring access to all Detroit businesses. We, th we do this through our certification program. If your business is located in Detroit, if you hire Detroiters, if you're headquartered in Detroit, you can get a special preference when you bid on city work. Our team makes sure that businesses can take advantage of this 
and have even eliminated some of the bureaucracy that have made this process difficult in the past. We've removed clearance requirements and taken the entire process online from application to site visit to payment. We are absolutely obsessed with making sure Detroit businesses know about opportunities for contracts and for work. We hold events to walk businesses through the process and have even held so several business crawls to encourage shopping at our Detroit businesses. When COVID-19 hit, it hit us hard. And in a city where the, where the majority of the residents are majority black, the impacts of COVID highlighted for us the disparities we already knew existed. And while my colleagues were working hard to get free testing from, for everyone to flatten the curve and working to lower our numbers, our team was working nonstop for Detroit businesses. We knew that we were tackling two crises at once, and we knew that the disparities in both crises, crises would be exasperated by this pandemic. So through our COVID business team, over 120 Detroit residents fed 26,000 meals to frontline workers. We launched our Digital Detroit program to help close the digital divide for Detroit businesses. We worked on the launch of DetroitMeansBusiness.org, a one-stop resource for businesses. We gave out free PPE, took the governor's executive orders and put them in a simple restart guide so that our businesses could know exactly what to do and how to restart. We didn't do all of that because we were just looking for something to do during the pandemic. We did it because with equity as our, at our core, and justice as, at our aim, as our aim, we had to make sure we were doing our part to stop the bleeding and close the gap on very real disparities. The other way I get to work toward equity and justice in the city of Detroit is by chairing Mayor Duggan's Equity Council. This council is a team of city leaders who meet regularly to ensure that every single thing we do is done with equity at our core and justice as our aim. Here's what we know now. The passion that flamed the summer of 1963 and beyond is still fanning flames in Detroit and the world today. The injustice may look differently, it may not be as obvious, but there are still barriers and the need for justice remains. The work now is more complicated and sometimes it's even tedious and boring. Breaking down walls of structural and systemic racism sometimes look like a boring policy change or eliminating a required form from a city process. Sometimes it's the elimination of an unsuspecting rule or unrolling a long overdue program like getting digital devices in the hands of youth. Or sometimes it's something innovative like paying Detroiters to get their high school diploma. This is the work that the Equity Council is dedicated to doing every single day, and we are only just beginning. So here's how you can help. Whether it's filing a complaint when you see or experience discrimination, taking our community survey, joining one of our race conversations, certifying your business, or even just following us on social media, there is a role for you to play in our journey toward the vision that Dr. King laid out so many years ago. Because at our very core, we are public servants. And we are desperately committed to doing the tedious, hard work with equity at our core, justice as our goal, and continuing the work that we've been doing for six years, knocking down barriers, innovating for opportunity, so that we can say that if nowhere else in Detroit, we have found liberty and justice for all. You can see uh, why we are so thrilled to have Charity Dean and as the head of the Equity Council, uh, she has every department asking the question every month, am I doing everything I can uh, to make sure we're giving Detroiters uh, every opportunity? Uh, so now we'll go to the questions phase. We will take questions for uh, one minute. If, uh, if you have a question to the extent you can uh, give it to us succinctly, we'll get through a few more of them. If you just want to give a statement, you can give a statement for up to one minute. So uh, I'm not the greatest technical expert, but this has worked out pretty well the last couple. Uh, you have to raise your hand. You can see the, dis the directions there. Uh, that's how you get called on. When you do get called on, you have to unmute uh, your phone or your iPad or, or whatever device you are operating out of. 
Uh, otherwise, you'll be talking and we won't know uh, that you're talking. Uh, and so when, uh, when you're accepted by the host, please tell us your name and what neighborhood you're from and ask your questions. And with that, we'll uh, take questions till 8.30. Who's up first? First is Kimberly. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Kimberly Marble. I am from District 4, um, also known as the Red Zone. Um, I'm really, really happy about everything that is happening because District 4 has been, um, we've been left out for a very long time. I have a very good Deputy District Manager. He tries to keep up with me. He talks if it's something that I need help with. I am so pleased with him. I'm just asking the city, please don't forget us when this pass, because I'm telling everybody, we must do this. These children around here, they don't know no different. It's been like this for over 20 years. And then a lot of these young people that are 20, they don't know no difference. They don't know what to reach for. I'm ready for those that need to be demolished to be demolished by the lots that I need to buy because they need somebody to show them. Somebody that is, is in Southfield, they can't show them what I can show them. I'm here in the trenches with them. I just ask that everybody, let's look forward and stop looking back. I'm ready. I'm ready to help redefine District 4 because District 4 does not define me. That's how I was raised. And I'm ready to share all of that with everyone else. Mayor, you have been there. You see what it looks like. It's a diamond in the rough. I need those houses down and I will be able to show these babies. Last week, I got a call from a young lady Hi. that watched us on the press conference. Her daughter got hit and she's had two surgeries in one month because they are racing down these streets. We need speed bumps. I know. I'm ready. So uh, you're extremely eloquent. Uh, and you know, it's, you're right though. People, uh, get used to what they know. Uh, and, and if you look at what we've done in the parks, I took the position that we are going to have really fine parks. We are going to go in and rebuild them. And, and we're not going to accept this overgrown grass and these rundown uh, baseball fields. But uh, when you go into the neighborhoods, uh, people have lived with blight so long, uh, they don't realize how terrible it is. And these children, uh, I, I, at Charity Dean's suggestion, I, I was recruiting summer uh, interns at uh, a number of the historically uh, black colleges and universities, and I spent some time in North Carolina and Atlanta, and the Detroit students there, when they go down uh, to these national schools and tell their friends from other city about the blight in Detroit, uh, they're shocked uh, that, that people from other cities don't have this kind of experience, and we have to change. Uh, the expectations. On the speed humps, uh, we can't build them fast enough. We're only our third year in. By the end of this year, I hope that every school and park has one, and then we are going to move on to the other streets. Uh, the other thing is that the police academies are filling up for all the controversy. We are seeing almost record numbers of uh, enrollments in the academy. And I know the commanders and Chief Craig will be very happy and that Chief Craig is here today. People have questions for him as well as most of the department heads. Uh, we need to have more traffic officers on the street to deal with these uh, speeders. So you're gonna see more, more speed humps this year, more speed humps next year. Um, and I agree with you. We, these kids should not grow up seeing these abandoned houses. And we'll see if we can do something about it. Who's next? Glee, telephone participants. Press star nine to raise your hand. Next is Aaron. Aaron, are you with us? Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. I'm Aaron Smith, and I'm owner of and I'm owner of the City of Detroit contractor, Detroit Grounds Crew. Okay. Providing janitorial services, eliminating blight, and beautifying the city. Mr. Mayor, we have a workforce of over 72 employees. Well, I'm proud to say that 85% that's 88.5% are city of Detroit residents. So Mr. Mayor and city council, I love the aspiration to create a city of Detroit eccentric ecosystem, which I call it. We are Creole certified in, the, in district four, Detroit headquarters located on Barham within Morningside. And Mr. Mayor, I just want you to know, I take a very personal interest 
in employing and mentoring young people and giving returning citizens an equal opportunity for employment. So as a certified Creole business, we're also a company that gives back to the city of Detroit through partnerships with Motor City Grounds Crew, East Warren Tool Library, and Disability Network Detroit Wayne. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity to compete, to allow us to compete for city of Detroit contracts. We are a city contractor living, breathing, sewing, and cultivating within the city of Detroit ecosystem. And I thank you very much that we can contribute toward uh, wealth and continue to make this city mm -hmm. attractive. Well, uh, it's, it's inspiring to hear your story of 72 employees. If uh, the people of, of the city uh, see fit to rehire me next year, I hope you'll call me back in two years and tell me you have 272 employees and you'll keep growing. And if anybody has not seen uh, the tool shed on East Warren, it is remarkable. Uh, lawnmowers and edgers and every piece of equipment you can imagine uh, that is leased out at very uh, uh, affordable rates to help uh, enable uh, neighbors to be able to fix up their own neighborhoods. What you guys are doing uh, is remarkable. And, and that's a big part of why uh, we're seeing that stretch uh, come by. And you're, you're going to be, I think, right in the middle of our streetscape improvements. So I hope you'll show up for those meetings as well. Uh, who's next? Phone number ending in 440. OK, if your number ends in 440, you are up. Hi, this is John Myers, and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to do this with the citizens. So uh, I live in Jeff Chalmers. I've been in this, on the east side for 57 years, and I finally got my way down to Jeff Chalmers and found myself my dream house on the canal. It's not such a dream house anymore because right. for the last two years I've had water flooding from the next-door neighbor's illegally built boathouse. And... I just looked out on the street and Scripps is full of water. Really? And it started January 12th this year. And the Tiger Dam engineer actually came to, the, to this property to try to figure out how to stop the water. And whatever this engineering disaster is next door to me, it's been very difficult. Is this the guy that's been in uh, the hospital? This is a different house? Me? Okay, I've been on scripts a number of times. I'm just trying to visualize which house. It is the guy that's been I'm right in the middle of the block. And yeah, yeah. No, we, we got a significant legal problem with him and his ability to deal with it. Uh, and we have to solve this. Uh, Dave Bell is our building safety and engineering department. I've been at the house myself uh, to see what the issue is. And it's a legally complicated one that, that I'm hoping Dave Bell has a solution for. So I'll let him talk. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, we are very familiar with the uh, house on Scripps and several other properties in that area. We are we're having conversations with the law department, and we are going to take legal action on three to four properties in that area. And we know the property you're talking about, and we are going to deal with it. Thank you. How soon do we look at that? Don't have a timeline just yet, sir. So here's here. Well, as, as, as you, my basement's got water in it right now, and my driveway's got green slime down it. Um, people that come visit me fall and slip, and and, and it's a disaster. I, I need some relief. Yeah, we we need the right to go on to that property. As you well know, if 90% of the people uh, construct a seawall, it doesn't do the neighborhood any good. Uh, we have to have the ability to go onto the property and deal with the recalcitrant. Uh, owners, but let's see if we can't get out and, and slow the water down a little bit. Uh, it's going to take us uh, uh, some time to get an order to essentially take over the guy's property and build it up. Uh, but uh, I'm going to track the lawsuit myself. Uh, Letty will get back to you with with an answer. But let's see if we can't do something uh, to slow that water. Appreciate it, Mayor. Is is as the water crested on the river yet? Well, we got northeast winds right now um, going about, you know, 9 to 11 miles an hour. That's the, that's the big deal. The wind's the problem, yeah. All right, we're, we're going to stay on it until we get it done, and uh, um, uh, it, it's a problem we're going to get fixed. But thank you for the call. Next is James. James? James, are you with us? Where? Yes, sir. James Jackson, known as Jackrabbit. Jack Rabbit, all right. Jeff Chalmers. Oh, what? What? Jeff Chalmers? Go way back, sir. 
We go way back. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you for all you've done for us with those tiger dams and the sandbagging and bringing all those old city employees down here to help out. You know, it really helped us a lot, as well as the cutting grass and our relationship with the police department. I know that's all because of you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank I you. Appreciate it. Nobody in my life ever gave me the nickname Jackrabbit. I don't know why not. Uh, all right, thank you for the call. Who's next? Next is CBSSR Cook. Okay, Mr. and Ms. Cook. Are you with us? I am here. Okay, how are you tonight? Okay, good. <laughs> I wanted to know if we're ever going to have the city uh, police officers and firemen living back in the city like they used to do. Well, I would like that. Uh, so yeah, I would too. In, in 1999, when John Engler was governor uh, and Dennis Archer was the mayor, uh, the legislature passed a law that made it illegal right. for any city. Uh, to require employees to live in that city as a condition of employment. And, and those who were around at the time, it, hit, it hurt this city badly. A lot of police officers and firefighters cleared out in a very short period of time, and it was devastating in a number of the neighborhoods. Uh, we, we need to deal with the reality uh, that we have a Republican House and a Republican Senate. Uh, and I am in favor of it. If I see an opportunity to pass it, I will. Uh, but I have to say, with the makeup of the legislature right now, uh, I just don't think that would fall on fertile ground. So what we've tried to do are some things uh, in a positive way. For example, our police and firefighters, if they bid on a land bank house, can get 50% uh, off whatever that price is because we're trying to move them uh, back into town. Chief Craig uh, adopted a policy for the neighborhood police officers that if they live in the city, they can take their police car home at night uh, to use it uh, mm -hmm. to and from work. So we're finding legal ways... Uh, to incentivize the police and firefighters uh, to live in the city. Um, but uh, right now, we're just not able to require them to. Okay. But thank you for the question. I get asked that a lot. A reminder, telephone participants, please press star 9 to raise your hand. Next is Kilbourne. Kilbourne. Are you with us? I don't know if Kilbourne's the first or last name, but is somebody named Kilbourne out there? Yes, can you hear me? I can. Hello, how's everyone doing tonight? Hello, Mayor. Well, it sounds like you're having a good night. Did I lose you? Hello? You still with us? I'm, I'm trying to stay unmuted. Okay. Okay. Keep yeah, I know. Sorry. I I'm, you, I'm not, this is my first time on Zoom for you, and I want to just say that I'm helping the community. I'm the Kilbourne president, and I'm helping over 300 kids in the Eden Gardens and Ravendale community. Uh -huh. And I just would like to know, is there any sponsorships that can, you know, help me? Because I'm doing this by myself, uh -huh. and tomorrow is pet pantry pickup, and my poor van, the, the air conditioning went out. And it's like kind of bad, you know, delivering all the it's like 61 pets that gets food and then I deliver diapers and I deliver to group homes and I deliver pantries. I just want to know if anyone out there could help because this is really, I've seen a lot of things out there. But Kids somebody is, power, somebody as big a heart as that, yours, there has to be a way to help. Uh, gotta be. Does somebody in this room have an idea on how to help? I'm doing this by myself. Okay. Okay. I enjoy it to the fullest, Mayor. It is Katie, do you have an idea? All right. All right. Here's our Deputy Chief Financial Officer. Normally, she cuts the budget of every person in this room, but she's coming to the front to help you, so we're all anxious to hear how she does it. Katie, come on up. Oh, my goodness. Uh, if we can just get your contact information, there may be a grant that we can. Uh, it's called the Choice Grant. We'll follow up with our grants office to see if, if you would apply. But... Uh, Oh, I guess I should take off my mask. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, well, uh, well, if you can leave your contact information with the media services, we'll follow up with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you kindly. You all have a wonderful evening. 
All right. Thank if you, Mayor. If you've got Katie on your side, you're most of the way toward being solved. And, uh, I'm and, really excited. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. All Everyone right. have a great evening. And the, the department has are going to want to know what the trick is to get Katie to help you. So. All right. Who's next? Next is Ionia. Ionia, are you with us? Yes, I am. How are you, Mayor? I'm good. How are you this evening? I'm fine. Listen, I live uh, the next block off of Benito from the Chrysler plant. Right. I'm two blocks from there. Right. And we're supposed to get a grant to repair our home. But my problem is I need uh, a wheelchair lift, and there's no telling when they're going to get around to doing Lily Bridge Street, which is where I live. And um, my daughter, they won't give her an electric wheelchair because she can't operate the controls. I'm 69 years old. I can't push her up a ramp. So the doctor wrote out a thing for a wheelchair lift. Right. I can't get homeowner's insurance. I can't get anything. So we're at a, a standstill. So let me start you with the prescription for the wheelchair lift. Who's the insurance through? Uh, the insurance group, she has um, priority health and Medicaid. Okay. So I want to I wanna start by following up to make sure uh, that if you're entitled to that benefit under your policy, uh, that we uh, help you enforce that. And then I'm going to take a look at uh, where we are on the home repairs. I know we started uh, at Beneteau. Uh, how long have you lived in that house? Almost 30 years. Yeah, then you're going to score really high on the preferences. Uh, so um, Letty Azar is going to call you tomorrow. She came out of the healthcare field. Uh, do you know Letty? She's your district manager. Uh, no, I don't. You're, you're going to meet. You're going to meet her tomorrow, and you're going to like her a lot. Uh, but she came out of the healthcare side. She's going to know exactly how to deal with those insurance companies. So we're going to start with that, and let's see if we can't uh, uh, we can't get your daughter in and out of the house. And then she will take you through exactly uh, what you have to do to make sure you're at the front of the line uh, on the home repair funds that come out of the FCA agreement. Okay, now I did see a drop on my auto insurance. Thank you very much. All right, how much did you save? <laughs> uh, was a couple of thousand dollars. All right, so so you're happy with me for a week? <laughs> I'm happy with that. It could be better, but I'm happy. With it. <laughs> All right. I can't get homeowners well, insurance. No matter what, I can't get homeowners insurance. Yeah. I know. We, 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 we're going to have to clean up that area to make it easier for you to get homeowner's insurance, but I'm really glad. So you obviously, you sent them your evidence that you're on Medicare and you got the break. That's terrific. Uh, people who are persistent enough are getting those kinds of savings on car insurance. Letty, have you got the contact number? We're going to make sure we have you. We've got your number, so you're going to hear from Letty tomorrow. And the next time, call me and let me know how you like Letty. Okay, because so far somebody likes her deputy, Dennis, but nobody has put in a plug for Letty yet. So I'm hoping you'll be the first. All right. Okay. Well, we, we will follow up, okay. seriously. Um, this is my last thing. Are you as many as you want? You're happy with your car insurance. I want to talk to you. In the last month, we've been out without uh, electric power. Yeah. Or more. Yeah. That's all I want to say about that. So I, I, and so there are so many people on the east side that have been without power. Uh, I invited DTE to come here and explain what they're going to do about it. Would you like to hear from them? Of course. All right. So uh, I, there's a representative from DTE, and you and I are going to hear the answer together. So come on up and introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Julie Jaswiak, DTE, um, the regional manager for the city of Detroit. I am also a longtime resident of District 4, so I suffered through those outages as well. So we've had our, uh, our share of storms that went through, especially the east side this summer starting in June, and um, really severe. It, one thing DTE um, knows is that about 75% of our outages are caused by trees. And that's the one thing we have on the east side that makes our neighborhoods really beautiful are those trees. So DT knows that for a while, it's like years back, like they, they had a lot of maintenance to do. So about seven years ago, they finally got the funding to get on a tree trim maintenance tree trim program that will have us all, um, when I say us, we mean circuits, at a cadence of every five years. If you're on Beneteau, um, 
the last time you had a tree trim maintenance go through there was about 2012. You're going to be due for that next year. So we'll be coming through for that maintenance program. What's a maintenance program? They look at every single house on the block or every lot as well. So they go back, they take an inventory of trees. We try to cut down trees and remove them fully. It does take residents' position, uh, um, permission because they are not DTE's trees, they are our trees, the homeowner's trees. So we need permission and you know sometimes we run across people who don't want their tree cut down. But honestly, if we really want to help prevent outages, that's one of the main ways to do it. We also have programs where we're coming through, we call it hardening, line hardening. So you look up on the top of the pole and there's capacitors, there's, there's um, fuses, and we're looking at the health of that. We're looking at the health of the braces on the top of the poles and replacing those. But the first thing we do is come through and tree trim because you need to do that to take care of the equipment. Um, so we know, especially, especially this summer, like, We've never had an instance where we're all at home relying on this for everything, right? You can't escape. There's nowhere to go. Um, and we're very sensitive to that. And I do know there are some residents of Benito that have asked for us to um, come up and talk to them a little bit more about what we're doing exactly in their community, and we're going to do that. Uh, we had outages because of the heavy rains this past weekend, and I want the engineers that know those circuits best to come out and talk to you directly, because I think that's the best way to understand how it works. Um, so again, I'm offering that to you. We do need a week or so to put something together, because we're gonna put a lot of technical information together about the history of your circuits. But again, we are coming through um, a good deal of the east side communities later this year and in 2021 to do that tree trimming program. Okay, let me tell you this, the house next door Wow, uh, okay, so District 4 has the Detroit Edison Regional Manager right in your neighborhood. Uh, so I guess uh, we'll probably see some improvement. You also have our DPW Director, Ron Brundage, and the General Services Director, uh, Brad Dick. So uh, District 4, I guess, will be getting a lot of attention. Uh, what's, who's next? A quick reminder, telephone participants, please press star nine to raise your hand. Others? Press the raise hand button or Alt Y on Windows, Option Y on Mac. Next is Monique. Monique, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Good evening. We can. Okay, great. Good evening. Um, I am a um, network manager and program administrator for the Equitable Internet Initiative. I am also a um, Morningside resident. I am asking questions relevant to um, Connect 313. Just okay. before I ask that, just a quick question for you. Do you consider internet more like a utility now that we've really seen the disparity of lack of internet since COVID-19? Absolutely. If you go back and look at Charity Dean's presentation about the fence, at this point, uh, the digital divide is very real. The gap between uh, the well-off and the not well-off is getting greater if we don't erase it. Fantastic. So how will the community be involved in decision-making, not suggestions, but decision-making in this Connect 313 proposal? So is Josh or Beth here? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have, I'm going to have Josh Edmonds, who's just absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'm going to have him come and present uh, the uh, entire uh, initiative, uh, and but basically his vision is this. Getting connected is one thing, and, and the corporations who bought 52,000 laptops for the school children of Detroit and got them connectivity, that was a step in the right direction. Josh's goal is that's just the price of admission. What we need to do is raise the skill level of our young people in our residents in using the technology, not just get you hooked up. And he has got uh, a, a, a really great plan. Uh, he's getting a lot of attention from around the country uh, on how we don't just get people hooked up, but then we use it to, to improve their education, improve career opportunities. So I'm gonna get Josh to come in here on one of these and do the full presentation. And I'm, it's too bad he's not here now because you would be very impressed with him. 
Um, I, I do know Josh. Oh, okay. Well, then let me ask you, are you impressed with him? I'm with the Equitable Internet Initiative. So we've been in this game and doing internet in the community, okay. community level since 2012. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Well, then a uh, last thing. Perhaps. Okay. Well, well you got to tell me though, is, is, is Josh a step in the right direction? Uh, well, our thinking in most cases are in the same light because we want people to have internet and be connected. We know that it's essential. And if I get too much on my soapbox, I'll take up this whole meeting. So I don't want to do that. I want to get to my, but yes, it, but however, my concern there is about the community engagement and also about him making sure to recognize the equitable internet initiative and the contributions that we've already made because much of this platform is uh, taken from a lot of the work that we've been doing. Well, I'm glad to hear it. it. Sounds like he took from a good person. Uh, so, uh, I, but he's going to hear about the fact that you asked today, and he wasn't here to answer the question. I'm sure he'll get in touch with you hey. uh, shortly. But you're making a you're making a really good point, and there've been people in fighting this battle for a long time. Uh, but it's it's interesting the way COVID uh, made folks understand when even before the governor shut down the schools. Uh, Gross Point and West Bloomfield and Birmingham and 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 Ann Arbor, all shut all shut down first because their students were always on the internet and the laptops and it made us really crystallize for a lot of companies what a huge gap uh, there is uh, between uh, uh, the wealthier districts and the less wealthy districts and of course what a huge gap there is in connectivity in general. So we're on it uh, and I'll make sure Josh uh, uh, talks to you. And, and listens to you carefully. You know, if Com last question, is Comcast the key provider for internet under this? Comcast is one provider, but he has plans for multiple uh, providers. But as you probably gathered, I am, I, I couldn't even know how to raise my hand on this, so I'm the wrong person to be asking the tech questions. But I know- uh, well, I'm glad you at least took the question. By okay, but, but I assume you agree that you want multiple providers. Uh, absolutely. Okay. And we want to make sure that uh, the community-based projects that are being done be acknowledged and included in decision-making levels, along with the community, like the Detroit Community Technology Project, which is the sponsor of the Equitable Internet Initiative. All right. Well, you, you have raised everybody's awareness tonight, and we'll make sure. Thank you very much for the call. Thank you. Next is Tracy. Hi, Mayor Duggan. Good evening. My name's Tracy Brown. Good evening. Uh, the question I have for you is, can you address concerns of residents who may welcome the uh, presence of federal officers to assist with crime, but also worry that it's a form of voter intimidation so close to elections? Well, it's definitely not a uh, voter intimidation. So uh, when, when COVID hit, I had people calling me saying, we need to get the National Guard in. And Chief Craig and I said, oh, no. Then if COVID weren't enough, when the protests hit, nearly every other uh, major city in America, many of whom were facing looting, looted stores, brought in the National Guard. And Chief Craig and I said, no, we can handle this ourselves. And that was respected. Uh, we have been absolutely clear with the federal government. Uh, that if they send any Homeland Security people in here, uh, that we will fight that tooth and nail. Uh, and they have agreed with that. In fact, I was very impressed with uh, U.S. Attorney Matthew Schneider, who was emphatic uh, that uh, the federal uh, folks uh, that, uh, that he had would have nothing whatever to do with the protesters. But when I was the prosecutor, I was in Washington, D.C., saying to the feds, uh, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Division is supposed to fight illegal firearms. There's firearms pouring into the city. What are you doing? Uh, I did the same thing under President Obama, who did give us uh, more help in gun prosecutions. And we have been arguing about this for a while. Uh, this is within federal jurisdiction. And Chief Craig and I believe the Fed should be doing more uh, to disrupt these gangs and deal with the gun violence. They have agreed to it. It's got absolutely nothing to do uh, with the, uh, the voting process. Uh, and, and everybody, please remember, tomorrow's election day. If you haven't voted uh, absentee, I don't think the lines will be very long at the polls, and they're geared up to, to have you vote uh, with social distancing. But we aren't going to. We aren't going to let anybody intimidate our voters. We need a massive turnout in the city of Detroit, November 3rd. Thank you. 
Thank you. A reminder, telephone participants, star nine to raise your hand. Press the raise hand button from your computer, alt Y for Windows, option Y from a Mac. Next caller is phone number ending in 014. Hello, good evening, Mayor. Uh, my name is Norma. Um, I just want to say thank you for all that you're doing, you and Chief Craig. Um, I've been in Detroit all my life, and I just see a great difference, and I know it's due to the mayor and the um, chief of police. So thank you for all that you do for Detroit. Thank you. Do you have a question? I want to. Okay, there's always a but. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? I just want to. I hear you just fine. What's the question? Oh, my question is about the uh, NEZ. Yeah. Um, the NEZ. I'm not for sure uh, what that's about. It's the Neighborhood Enterprise Zone. Right. Um, I've been presented with that. I don't understand what it is. I've been kind of hesitant to fill it out. Do you have one now? And I also want to. I'm sorry. Where, where do you live? I live on the east side of Detroit, right by Ca by Cashew on Guilford. Okay. Uh, so the so I'm going to bring the world's expert in NEZ here, Katie Hammer. But I can tell you the short answer: fill it out. It's it's it, if you are eligible for it, it's worth significant savings to you. And I know Katie knows the answer, and she's going to be able to tell you in detail what to do. Okay, before she comes, just about the, and also about the grant. Do you have any grants for this area and also about the fire hydrant? I have a fire hydrant sitting right in my yard, and it's just really an eyesore. And I wanted to paint it, but I know I just can't go out there and do it. So I just wanted to know about those two things, the grants in this area and the fire hydrant. So well. I, I don't know that we have any grants. Uh, Gary Brown is going to come up and answer the fire hydrant question, uh, but if your NEZ works out, you'll feel like it's a grant. So, Katie, why don't you talk about okay. the NEZ? Hi. There are a few different types of NEZs. There are NEZ homesteads for, uh, I think that's in most cases what you would be eligible for is an NEZ homestead. And it's an opportunity to uh, get a reduction on the mills that you pay on your property tax. And so if, mm -hmm. you, live, if you live in an NEZ homestead area and you make a, a fi uh, improvement on your house that's worth, I, th I think, about $500, uh, you may be eligible for an NEZ homestead if you live in this area and you live in the house that you own. Um, and so you should apply for that. And it's, uh, it's I think, 10 uh, I can't remember if it's 10 or 15, I think it's 15 years worth of uh, an abatement. Uh, so I encourage you to fill that out. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, we supply paint all the time to uh, block clubs or neighbors that would like to paint their fire hydrant. If we could have your address uh, tomorrow morning, I will have the paint, some brushes dropped off and and allow you and, and thank you for uh, taking the time to beautify, awesome. beautiful, uh, beautiful, awesome. by your okay. fire hydrant. How would I get in contact with you? We, we, we got your number and uh, I guarantee you somebody will contact you tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you. So you'll, you'll get a call in the morning from the water department. Uh, and I didn't know we had that program. I learned a lot by doing these things. All right, next question. The next is Minnie. Minnie, are you with us? Yes. Good evening. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yes. I just, uh, my name is Minnie Lester. I live in Jefferson Chalmers. I'm a president of Southeast Waterfront Neighborhood Association. And I just want to thank you and Letty Azar. Oh. for doing the things that you're doing. She is wonderful. Whoever get to know her will love her. Um, and I want to thank you for the things that you're doing for Jeff Chalmers. We are really, really happy about the things that's happening in Jefferson Chalmers. Well, Ms. Lester, you've hung in there for a long time. How long you been in that neighborhood? Uh I've been here since 73, but my husband's been here since uh, 40. He's been here since the 40s. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, we did the park up there. Right, I remember. We really, really appreciate everything that you have done for us in this area. 
Well, we're going to keep working it. You saw it when it was great and it hit bottom and it's coming back, but you've got so many beautiful houses there and we're going to stay committed until we get it all the way back. But thank you for all you've done. Thank you. Okay, and Letty got a plug, so her day is made. All right, who's next? Next is phone number ending in 862. Okay, if you end in 862, you're up. You are unmuted. You may speak. Your phone number ends in 862. It's your turn. Eight six two. Eight six two. Are you with us? Uh, now, do you hear me? I we sure can. Oh, okay. I had turned off. Yes, uh, I have a question. Some of my questions been answered already about the uh, initiative for three one three. Um, the streetscape. Now, you said that people have a um, part that the neighbors have a part in. Right. Voting on that or something? How do they do that? How do they get to vote? So, do you vote? do you do you live in that area? Yes. Okay. I live in uh, Warren and uh, okay. yeah, between so, Warren and Mac and Weber. So we've had, I think, one or two community meetings already. There's all kinds of notices that go out, and if you'll stay on, I'll have Letty Azar get your contact and send it to you directly. Um, but what's going to happen is the next meeting is going to come up. I'm going to say in the next month. Uh, and uh -huh. what will happen is the design, street design folks will come out and they'll say, here's three or four or five different options. And then people will talk, and I've been in a lot of these meetings, some people want a wider sidewalk, a lot of the business owners. Some people want to shorten mm -hmm. the distance across the street because they think it's too difficult to take a, get a child to walk all the way across without getting hit. Everybody has these conversations. And, um, uh -huh. And by the end of the year, we will make a decision on what that design is. I'll do the last meeting myself where I invite everybody out, let everybody talk, and then we'll get down to the two favorite designs and people will vote. Uh, and so I will make sure, do we, have, do we have the contact information here? We've got your contact. So Letty's going to call you tomorrow and make sure you're personally invited to the next meeting. Okay. And I have like one other question and that's it. Go ahead. I think the CARE program. You said that CARE program had maybe a little, little it's a small amount set aside for seniors if they had like a minor repair for their home. So is it that, how do we get that? Now there is- Like a hole in my basement, right? With water coming in my basement when it rains. Yeah, and, there, um, there is quite a, a wait list on that. Are you on the wait list already? Okay. Yeah, okay. I think I did put it, putting the name on the wait list. Okay, so, so yeah, so we're trying to get through the wait list that we have right now, so we aren't opening it for new applicants, but if you're on the wait list, there's a good chance we're going to get to you. So I don't know okay. if Arthur Jemison said, right. Arthur, how long is it going to take us to get through the wait list? Okay, so it, we'll get through the wait list in the next year or so, and just depending on where you fall in it, we'll determine how soon we get to you. And, and we're waiting right now. Uh, from a decision from the federal government on some additional money that if it comes, we'll speed that up. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And matter of fact, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. I have to tell you that. Okay. Bye. Next is Cookie. All right. Cookie, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, Mayor Duncan, can you hear me? I sure can. You're very clear. Oh. Oh, okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm Cookie from Cornerstone Village, and I would like to start off by saying thank you um, for having this meeting and everything, and thank you for all you do. I'd like to do a shout out of thanks to Letty Azar as well. She's awesome. And I also want to do a shout out for um, uh, Ron Brandage because Brandage, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correct, but he helped me. Well, Ron said if, it's, if you're saying something good, you can call him whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was awesome as, um, as far as getting us a trash container for one of our bus stop areas. Oh, good. And I talked to him, I mean, I emailed him yesterday and uh, well, as far as getting it cleared out. And today he got it cleared out. Well, for come up here and take a bow. Well, okay, I, we got to come on, Rob. We got a 24 hour turnaround on a garbage request. I don't get these calls that often. Come, <laughs> come on up here. It was awesome. 
I don't know if you remember my email that I sent you. <laughs> I, I hope you can't see me blushing up here. I, I do remember uh, uh, emailing back and forth with you yesterday. Thank you very much for your comments. Yes. Yes. So. Now everybody knows who to guys, email to get the trash taken care of. Go ahead. You have something else you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, As, since you asked. <laughs> I want to talk about these um, signs that's on these poles, those um, uh, illegal signs that's all over, the, all, all over the poles on the city of Detroit. Yeah. I, I pull them off along with some other of our neighbors. How can we get them to tell the people uh, who, the, who does the signs to stop doing it? So I'm going to give you part of Lawrence Garcia's salary uh, because it's his job to sue the people to get them to take the size down, but you're doing them first. So Lawrence, I want you to come on up here and explain what you're going to do. It drives me nuts, these signs on these poles. Uh, so, so you and I are together on this. I'm going to let you talk to Lawrence. Okay, thanks so much. Good evening, Cookie. Um, th this is a tough one, and COVID has made it especially difficult. Uh, for us to address this. It, it, we need to collect the information or the evidence that will be used uh, to prosecute the, the wrongdoing. So when you take those down, if you can uh, supply that information, the signs where you took them down, that will assist. What we do is we try to find the, per, the party responsible behind the phone number. And a lot of times it's a company that it's hard to hold criminally liable. But if we can find an individual behind that phone number, then we do charge them and because uh, it, it is a crime. So um, right. we're, we're trying to be more systematic with that and we're trying to get uh, police officers to make time to, to assist with the collection of this evidence. But if you're collecting it, then that, that makes it even easier. So I'm going to make sure that my office calls you tomorrow morning to follow up on how we can collect the evidence you've already gathered and maybe we can get after those folks that are doing it in your neighborhood. But the mayor's telling the truth. Uh, he's been on me to fix this problem for a long time, and it's proved uh, very difficult. It's like whack-a-mole. You know, you hit them down over here, and they pop right. up over there. And so we're just chasing, chasing else. around. Correct. And who is this? It's a TP for sheriff. I thought that they couldn't do that. Uh, that's all over the place as well. And that just drives me crazy. <laughs> yep. Yep. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there's there's a simple way uh, to deal with TP for sheriff. Just uh, tomorrow, vote BN. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Who's next? Phone number ending in four four zero. Four four zero. Lawyers again. And oh. I wanted to touch on the sign thing too, but I thought it was a little too petty. Can you repeat uh, how, to, uh, how to who to contact on that? Uh, and so, then the second thing is we've got some hazardous storm drains over in Jefferson Chalmers. One's on Manistique, one's on Navajo. Um, the, the one on Manistique is literally collapsing. The street is collapsing, and we still don't have a barricade after a few months of uh, reporting it on Improved Detroit. And then we have a couple of just missing uh, catch basin uh, grates on Navajo and Essex. Okay, well, you got a better method than improved Detroit. Here's Gary Brown. Yeah, we, we have crews that deal with that every single day. So if I can just get your phone number or, or we've got it. I'm being, I'm being nodded at that we have your phone number. We will contact you tomorrow. I just need the locations of where the missing uh, catch basins are, and we will get them repaired within uh, 24 hours. Appreciate it. And then as far as the signs, illegal signs, who, who do we contact on that? Uh, so if you talk to, talk to, to Letty, your, your uh, uh, okay. district manager, normally what happens is the general services department goes out and just pulls them all down, and the ones that have uh, the most uh, uh, frequent numbers our prosecutors call those numbers, and usually that convinces them not to engage in the activity uh, any further. Uh, I haven't been really excited about making our staff go out and handle all these signs in the middle of COVID. So as Lauren said, we've slowed down a little bit, but that doesn't stop us from uh, calling them 
Uh, and uh, and so, so Lawrence will get your number two, and he'll talk to you about where, uh, where they are. Uh, but usually, they, they, you get them on the phone. Sometimes we get them to actually show up thinking they're going to buy a, uh, somebody's trash <laughs> car or whatever their sign is. And when they meet a prosecutor, it usually is the last time they, they put up a sign. So I am obsessed uh, with these, uh, these signs on these polls. And I'm sorry it's bad this year, but we'll get back after it. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Who's next? Next is Lakila. Lakila, are you here? Lakila, you may need to unmute. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Yeah, no problem. I've done it many times. I think she did not. I, I think you did it again. Okay, we can't hear you right now, Lakila. I think Lakila was saying that she did not mean to raise her hand. Oh, she, okay. Okay, who's next? Okay, we have a couple that have already spoken. Um, okay, we got five minutes left. So if there's anybody new, let's take somebody new. Otherwise, we'll do reruns. Yep, no new ones. All right, so we're going to take some reruns. Go ahead. Okay, Ms. Cook. All right, Ms. Cook, you're back. Yep, I'm back. Okay. I live in East English Village. I'm next door to a house that's vacant. I keep the lawn cut, but I, I've left messages that uh, we will be interested in buying a house. No one has responded. What can I do? So do you know who owns the house? Yes, I looked it up on the treasury and I found their name, but I can't find any kind of information other than that. They're a private owner? Yes. Yeah, so we can't force a private owner to sell to you. Uh, but what we intend to do is step up the nuisance abatement lawsuits. Uh, and if we can pull your number, Letty, why don't you pull the number? We'll get Tim Devine at the land bank to file a nuisance abatement suit to make your neighbor either fix up the house or deed it to us. Uh, and, and we'll jump on that. Okay, yeah. you're having to cut the grass. They're not doing it themselves? No, they're not. Yeah. So and they had a, a tree when we had the big storm. Yeah. Their branch came crashing down on my fence and then into my yard, and uh, so it caused a lot of damage. Okay, so Tim is uh, Tim is off for a couple of days, but uh, we're going to get him on this by the end of the week. So Letty will call you tomorrow. We'll get the address, and we'll get a lawsuit filed on him. Sounds great. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, and our last call of the evening, who do we have? This is actually a new call from a Galaxy S8. Galaxy. No name, just Galaxy S8. S8? S. Okay, so if you're on a Galaxy S8 and you're trying to talk, apparently you're on. Okay, we'll move on to Nina. Okay, last call of the night will be Nina. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. This is Nina Payne um, uh, from... Uh, the east side. I live on, I uh, have a house over here on Cashew and uh, Hereford. We have a problem neighbor in the backyard of us on Neff. Um, and we've complained several times on the C Click Fix site. Okay. If you're familiar with the C Click Fix site. Okay. And we found I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with it. So, what exactly is the issue with the neighbor? Well, um, garbage, junkyard, rodents. We need, we need to bring them uh, under compliance with the code. Dave Bell is going to talk to you and then we will take your number offline and he will get somebody out tomorrow. Dave, come on up. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we will definitely look into this matter um, and we appreciate you bringing this to our attention. Uh, you should not have to live like this, so we are definitely going to get somebody out there tomorrow to address this matter for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Buddy, we'll make sure we've got that contact and, uh, and we'll get uh, BC to reach you tomorrow. All right. Well, thank you all very much for the, uh, the calls, and uh, you can expect us to follow up uh, promptly. Have a great night.